regards to SB 1383, and they are the consulting firm that CalRecycle is using um, on several of the implementation projects. So we feel very uh, fortunate to have them as our guide uh, to get us through and uh, get systems in place to be able to comply with the new state law that's coming. So please welcome Lauren and Allison. busy in helping the state uh, that we agreed that if I did the slides, uh, she'd come and help with questions. <laughs> uh, so SB 1383 is being considered the biggest piece of waste and recycling legislation to be passed in California in the last 30 years. So that's why we're talking about it. That's um, why it's on everyone's minds, um, particularly because the requirements and penalties associated with the act uh, not only fall to cities as other laws have in the past, uh, but also to waste haulers and to, more importantly, res uh, regular residents and businesses. As Becky said, uh, HFNH has been heavily involved in tracking the progression of the SB 1383 rulemaking process. Uh, we've been working with agencies up and down the state uh, to help them develop plans so that they're ready to comply when the time comes. Um, and as she said, we're currently working with the state to develop model tools that will also be available to help local agencies and businesses when the time comes. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is giving a brief overview of SB 1383 as it relates to businesses, uh, and then we'll be looking at what uh, local businesses are going to need to have to do to comply. Uh, the good news is that uh, being located in the city of Pleasanton in Alameda County, you've got a tremendous group of people working for you in advance of the compliance uh, timeline and uh, developing great resources. So you've got a big head start uh, over most, I would say, agencies in the state. Certainly over a lot of the agencies that I've been working with lately. Okay, so in 2016, Governor Brown established statewide goals for the reduction of short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, and this included a 50% reduction in black carbon emissions Black carbon is essentially the black sooty material that's emitted from burning fossil fuels. It included a 40% reduction in hydrofluorocarbon emissions, or HFCs, uh, which are used in refrigeration, air conditioning, and aerosols. And really what our focus today is on the 40% uh, reduction in methane emissions. So why uh, in this room today do we care more about uh, methane than perhaps the other two? I think when people typically think of greenhouse gases, they often think of carbon dioxide. Uh, but methane in our atmosphere can actually be up to 28 times more potent in terms of having a greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. And uh, when things that are made out of plant and animal materials, so referred to as organic materials throughout here, uh, when those types of materials are left to decompose in a landfill without oxygen, they break down in such a way as to create a lot of methane. Uh, in fact, it's estimated that 20% of methane emissions uh, in the state of California come from landfills. And what's concerning about that is that about two thirds of the material that currently gets sent to landfill falls into this subset of organic waste. So what SB 1383 does is establish some additional goals related specifically to removing those methane generating products from the place where they will generate methane. And specifically, that's a 50% reduction of organic waste to landfill by 2020, a 75% reduction of organic waste to landfill by 2025, and also recovery of 20% of edible food that's currently uh, discarded by 2025. Uh, the definition of organic waste is also expanded under the new law. Uh, it includes now uh, what you would traditionally think of as organics, uh, yard trimmings and food scraps, but it also includes other plant and animal materials such as paper and cardboard, uh, which you would normally you know, think of as being just recyclables. They are now also considered organics uh, and also textiles and manure, for example. Uh, so those are the goals, and it's not uncommon for government agencies to set sort of aspirational goals like this, uh, but what makes these particular goals so noteworthy is they come with some very big associated requirements and action steps to get to those goals uh, with significant penalties for non-compliance. And uh, without getting too far into the weeds, 
Uh, it's important to note that these goals are statewide. Uh, no individual agency or generator will be penalized for failure to meet these numerical goals. Uh, but what will be enforced, and enforced um, I think pretty strongly, are the very specific requirements that the state has established uh, for local agencies and haulers and businesses and residents uh, to get us collectively as, at a, as a state to these goals. As I said, uh, the city is working very hard with PGS and with us uh, to get ahead of this. Uh, these are the compliance requirements for local jurisdictions. Um, to put it in context, the uh, requirements for businesses are shorter, so be happy about that. Um, so first, uh, every local agency needs to establish a organics collection program. Uh, the city's working with PGS on that right now. Uh, they are required to add ordinances and policies to the city code that will help frame those programs and uh, ensure participation in them. They need to establish a program to recover edible food that would otherwise be thrown away. They need to ensure residents and businesses are educated both on the law, the reasons why putting organics in the landfill is bad, and uh, also on how to participate in the local programs. Uh, they need to actually procure products that are made from recovered organic waste. Uh, to ensure that there's a market for these organics once they are pulled out of the landfill. Uh, they need to perform ongoing inspections of whether and how their residents are, and businesses are participating in the programs. They need to enforce compliance among those who may not be participating in the way they're meant to. Uh, and lastly, they need to comply with substantial reporting requirements so that the state can keep up with how the law is working. And as I mentioned, there are big penalties for non-compliance, some as high as $10,000 per day. Uh, so again, the city has been working to get these things in place so that you all have the tools you need to comply. Uh, as a business in the city of Pleasanton, you'll be required to participate in the organics program. Uh, what that essentially means is providing containers for organics and recyclables in all areas where disposal yeah. containers are provided for your staff and also for customers. Uh, and those containers need to comply with specific color and labeling requirements. Uh, as I said, the city will be required to conduct inspections to make sure that its residents and businesses are complying. And so you as the business uh, will need to cooperate with the city to coordinate those visits. You'll need to educate your staff on proper participation in the program and conduct inspections yourself to make sure that staff is sorting the way that they should. Uh, and lastly, and we'll discuss this more uh, later on, if you're a business that generates edible food waste, you'll need to participate in some form of edible food recovery program. Um, and I have a note here that you should also check for waivers that may exempt certain businesses um, from needing to comply with the full set of requirements. Um, however, that's not as big of an issue, I think, here in Pleasanton. But we'll get there. Uh, so in terms of developing the organics program, the state gives us a handful of options. Uh, agencies can have a single container program uh, where you dump everything in one can and then uh, all that trash is taken to a facility that does the sorting for you. And the complication with this option, though, is that for this to comply under SB 1383, the facility that you take your materials to to be sorted needs to demonstrate some very high material recovery standards. Uh, agencies can also have a two-container system, uh, often known as wet-dry, where everything that can, essentially everything that would rot can go in one container and everything that won't, for example, your glass and your plastics, uh, goes in the other. Uh, the three-container system here, ta-da, uh, probably looks pretty familiar because that's what we've got here in the city of Pleasanton, uh, where you have one container for traditional recyclables, your glass, uh, plastic, dry, uh, clean paper, uh, another container for yard trimmings and food scraps, and then a third container that will go to the landfill. Uh, we have the black, blue, green containers identified here uh, because that color scheme is in fact part of the new regulations. Um, and the state also provides for additional separation options. Uh, often businesses won't generate any yard trimmings, for example, but they'll generate a ton and a ton and a ton of food waste. Uh, in those instances, agencies may have a food waste only collection program, uh, which can be accomplished through an additional brown container. Uh, the old versions of the regs, it, it would say yellow, that's 
Brown. Uh, but the takeaway here is that uh, in the city of Pleasanton, you've got the three container system uh, that you're likely already familiar with. I mentioned that we discussed waivers. Uh, individual businesses may be exempt from participating in the full suite of requirements if they can demonstrate a few things. Uh, first, that you just don't generate the material. Um, so if you are a business that generates over two cubic yards of solid waste per week, but you can demonstrate that you generate less than 20 gallons per week, per week of blue and green card materials, you may be exempt. Uh, similarly, if you're a business that generates under two cubic yards per week of solid waste, um, but less than 10 gallons of uh, blue or green card materials, you may be exempt. Uh, second, if you can document that there just isn't space in your facility, and uh, we've heard about this a little bit today, I, I wouldn't put my eggs in the I don't have space so I won't comply basket because I think um, in Pleasanton and in Alameda County, that's not, uh, that's probably not gonna be an option that's available to you. Uh, but it is, a, you know, it's there in the state law so we wanna talk about it. Uh, and lastly, on the program, the programs on the last slide are all uh, intended to be weekly collection, but agencies have the option to extend collection of materials that won't rot, essentially, to be every other week. Again, probably not something we're gonna bump up against in Pleasanton. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, businesses are required to do some education and outreach, and that's what this, or this is what that looks like. Uh, businesses are required to provide new information to their staff, tenants, and customers on an annual basis and provide new information to tenants within two weeks of occupancy. And the information uh, you have to provide is essentially a notice that they need to comply with the Organic Waste Recovery Program. Uh, I believe there needs to be some mention uh, of the benefits of organic waste recycling. Uh, you need to provide them instructions on how to uh, comply with the program that you have um, so essentially what goes in which container. And as you've heard, there's education is a big, big component of this. Okay, I also mentioned that we would get to edible food recovery. Uh, SB 1383 breaks down edible food generators into two uh, big buckets. Tier one is your supermarkets, your big grocery stores, your food service distributors, and your wholesale food markets. And these businesses will need to have an edible food recovery program in place by January 1, 2022. So that's just two years from now. Uh, and this is recovering food to be eaten, not recovering food to go into compost. Uh, tier two commercial edible food generators will be your larger restaurants, your hotels, your healthcare facilities, uh, large venues and events, state agency facilities, and local education facilities in compliance for uh, tier two generators is uh, January 1, 2024, so four years from now. So that's who needs to participate. Uh, here's a look at what those folks will need to do. 1383 requires uh, that these businesses recover edible food that would otherwise be disposed. Uh, and this can be done by either contracting with a food recovery organization that comes by your premises and picks up the edible food uh, and distributes it to hungry people, or by self-hauling to organizations that will accept uh, the edible food for recovery. Uh, I will note as a side, not that I think anyone in this room would be capable um, or intend to do this, but SB 1383 specifically prohibits against uh, intentionally allowing food to spoil so that it is no longer suitable uh, for recovery. Uh, SB 1383 further requires that the businesses keep records documenting what they have done to recover the edible food. That includes documentation of where it was taken, who collected it, uh, copies of any contracts that may, you may have for that service, and details regarding uh, what and how much food you've sent for recovery. Uh, note that if you choose to haul the material yourself, uh, rather than contract with someone else to pick it up, there will be an additional reporting uh, beyond just your own record keeping uh, requirements uh, that we can discuss offline uh, if you have got questions about that. Uh, and these are just the nuts and bolts of what you have to do uh, under the new law. We discussed the uh, environmental reasons of why you may want to be keeping 
food out of a landfill uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, but we haven't discussed the human element of all this, which is of course that in California and in the Bay Area in particular, there are a distressing number of food insecure uh, people and families. And we would certainly rather see perfectly good food uh, go to those people rather than into the trash. Uh, but in addition to helping hungry people in your community, businesses can also save money by reducing your garbage bill. And uh, another reason to keep good records, uh, food donations like this are eligible uh, for tax deduction. And lastly, there's another piece of legislation to be aware of, and the way that it overlaps with SB 1383 is kind of funky. Um, it was just passed in September of last year. Uh, it's called AB 827, and uh, the requirements for businesses are essentially such that if you're complying with 1383, you're covered for 827, but 827 happens sooner. So, um, in July of this year. And it's, what it does essentially is require uh, businesses who are already required to, to provide recycling under AB 31, 341 uh, and organics under AB 1826. Uh, those businesses are required to provide recycling and organics containers for customers to use wherever you have a trash location. Um, and those containers need to be clearly labeled to educate customers on what should go in each bin. Uh, and I'll clarify, uh, Restaurants don't apply to full service restaurants where someone's going to be busing the trash away from your table. If it's a situation where you're busing your own trays, um, you've got to have that three, that three container system. Uh, and CalRecycle is going to be developing a model signage for public use so you don't have to design these yourself. And as we heard, a Stop Waste also has a wealth of resources available to you on their website. Yeah. 